Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. The hit cast offers a weekly look at Hollywood from a conservative point of view. Sick of media bias infecting Hollywood headlines? Tired of stars insulting your views? Hit has your back. Now, here's your host, Christian Toto. Welcome to episode 116 of the Hollywood and Toto podcast, The Right Take on Entertainment. This week we're speaking with Leanne Lunson, director of the new film Waiting for the Miracle to Come, starring music legend Willie Nelson. You'll learn what makes Willie unique, and it might surprise you, along with some of the heavy hitters behind this movie. And before my official monologue, I just want to say thank you. I've been uh, getting some really kind notices about this podcast, usually on Twitter, which is, of course, is a great place to check in with people. But just, you know, the, the number of podcast downloads have been increasing, number of listens have been increasing, and the number of messages that are saying some nice things are on the rise as well. So again, many thanks. This is a labor of love for me. Uh, it's kind of part of what I do, but it's becoming more and more important as the weeks go on. And I just love podcasting. And again, I really appreciate the kind comments. And I'm also open for a constructive criticism too. So fire away if you've got that and just be gentle. You know, there are some celebrities who may be on the verge of losing their mind. I know we talk about Trump derangement syndrome, but by golly, you know, I joke about a lot of this material. I often tweak it on the tweet of the week, which I'll do in just a few minutes, but I wanted to draw attention to three separate comments from three people of note in the Hollywood community. First up is Rosanna Arquette. Here's one of her recent tweets about life in Trump's America. I just want to wake up and feel some peace and love in the world and not feel terrorized that we are living under a fascist regime as of today. What do you say after that? The thing is that she's not alone, though. This isn't some raving and ranting celebrity who is the exception to the rule. There are other people who say kind of sort of the same thing. Take Amy Poehler, a pretty funny lady living out a rather successful comedy career. She recently talked to The Hollywood Reporter about many things, including some of her projects, including a new Netflix film called Wine Country coming very soon. And I have to say, the way that she describes this country right now It sounds like she's a character from The Walking Dead. It's that extreme, that apocalyptic. Listen to her existential sense of dread just from this paragraph alone. Here we go. Women have been rightly and righteously furious about this administration and have been working together and bonding together just in an attempt to make sense of all of it, she said. Every woman I know has a text chain. Every morning we just say, can you believe it? Can we break this down together so I don't lose my mind? Anybody out there? Because it's really crazy-making. Not to be outdone and also to get some gender balance here, here's part of a little poem that Jim Carrey, the once great comedian, wrote on Twitter and shared with his massive following. Of course, it's about Donald Trump. Let's all drink a toast to the new king of lies and the minions who help him while democracy dies. Can we pass the hat around for some psychological counseling? Now, on a more serious note, I think all this fear and loathing is really going to hurt Hollywood when it comes to the 2020 presidential campaign. Of course, they want to unseat Trump. I get that. It's what they're going to do. And the messaging is going to be fast and furious. But, you know, the average voter is going to look around, consider his or her life and think, you know, living in Trump's America is just like it was four years ago before he even entered the scene. And they're going to see all these panicked celebrities with all their outrageous claims and think, well, they're not really making any sense. As a matter of fact, they're liars. And I really think it's going to hurt their get-out-the-vote efforts. What do you think? Here's the hit tweet of the week. Now, I know we're talking about Trump derangement syndrome yet again, but boy, Rob Reiner is the absolute prince of that particular malady. This is a guy who directed Stand By Me, The Princess Bride. This is frickin' Spinal Tap. What happened? He hasn't made a good movie in a very long time, and his Twitter feed is just absolutely bonzo, gonzo crazy. Now, here's just a recent example of what he's trying to share on Twitter. And suffice to say, the whole there's no collusion from Robert Mueller didn't quite sink in. Here we go. 
Every day Trump prevents anyone from his administration from testifying to Congress is another day he commits obstruction of justice and contempt of Congress. His criminality is breathtaking. Enough is enough. Hashtag Americans for impeachment. You know what I want to see? I want to see a reality show following Rob Reiner around if Trump wins a second term. That would be entertaining. You're listening to my daddy's podcast. His name's redacted 12 times in the Mueller report. My hit tip of the week is Sing Street. And I'm a massive fan of John Carney. He's a musician turned director. And if you don't know the name, you know his movies most likely, especially once. He also directed Begin Again and, of course, most recently, Sing Street. Now, the latter came and went about a year or two ago with absolutely no fun fanfare. It was, I don't want to say it was a complete dud at the box office, but it didn't make much of a ripple in the popular culture. And boy, I'm still grumpy about that. The film follows an 80s teen from Ireland who's desperate to connect with a beautiful young girl in his neighborhood. So what does he do? Well, he starts a band from scratch and casts her in their new music video. This is the 80s, remember? It's what you did. The rest, I just love it. Romance, comedy, nostalgia, teen love, all coming together with some really good music, just as good of an added bonus. Now, Carney is an absolute genius at making music and storytelling one and the same. And if you haven't seen Begin Again with Kira Knightley and Mark Ruffalo, well, I certainly recommend Sing Street, but you've got to watch that one too, any way possible. The good news is that Sing Street is streaming right now for free on the Roku channel. You're listening to the Hollywood in Toto podcast, the right take on entertainment. Leanne Lunson is a documentary filmmaker who just shot her first narrative feature, and she had some pretty high-profile help along the way. U2's Bono not only wrote a song sung by the star, Willie Nelson, but he also produced it. Got your attention yet? Directorial legend Vim Vendors also helped produce the film, with the provocative title Waiting for the Miracle to Come. The movie stars Sophie Lowe as a young woman trying to help an older couple save their beloved ranch. The film was shot on Willie Nelson's Texas ranch, an iconic place where Leanne first met Willie years ago. The film hits both DVD and digital formats like Amazon and iTunes on April 29th, Willie Nelson's birthday. Lunson talks about working with Willie Nelson, how the improbable story came about in the first place, and also how Faith connects some pretty big celebrities, something she's noticed and I thought was rather provocative in itself. Here's my chat with Leanne Lunson. You know, Leanne, I think most filmmakers would kill to cast Willie Nelson in a movie, let alone cast him and shoot him at the Iconic Ranch. Talk about when you first had the story in mind, you built it around Willie. Did you know all along that he would be on board? Did you have to kind of sell the project to him? Or how did, how did that part of the, uh, the film come about? Well, I shot a documentary um, in the mid-90s with Willie mm-hmm. at his ranch, um, and we talked about it back then. I had made a commitment that I would write something for him. And so Willie was on board way back then. Okay. Um, it took me a long time because I went off and did other projects. But, you know, he was, um, he was on board from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, took, it did take a while. Was it just something y- you needed to share? Was it the kind of thing that you just wanted to tell a story with Willie? Why did you kind of cling to this so so passionately? Because a lot of times you could, like you said, you've been busy, you've been directing other projects, you could have let it go, but you didn't. What was the, what was the main sort of attraction where you thought, I need to tell the story? Well, I think it was more about Willie Nelson because, uh, you know, I think he's 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 so busy doing his music. Mm-hmm. He's very underused in his later years as an actor and. I think that his connection to people, you know, it, it, that carries through on screen. So, and I wanted to explore the idea of family and and what that sort of complicated uh, experience can be mm-hmm. for broken families. You know, yeah, that was my main uh, goal in the story, and I I, I just wanted. You know, I worked it all around Willie Nelson, but the story was always there, you know, the story about family Mm -hmm. and connections. Gotcha. 
you know, uh, waiting for the miracle to come, it's, looking at it, it's ethereal. The time period here is blurry. We don't know exactly when it's set. The look of the film is, is sort of rich and, and has sort of a magic realism flair. Uh, talk about using that approach to tell this family-based story, because I think it's interesting. Well, I, I wanted to create a timeless world so that people, you know, they didn't associate these emotions with a particular time, mm-hmm. because I think these emotions that happen with people and family, they, they're the same no matter what period it is. So, I, And I also wanted to explore this sort of broken family story within a fairy tale-like world, you know. I think that these, these mm, subjects are quite harsh and I wanted to really sort of invite people in and just let them be able to feel this experience in a very slow meditative way and, you know, create a sort of a sort of an old storybook sort of scenario with these really real situations. Mm-hmm. You've talked in the past about how as a filmmaker you have to kind of roll with the punches. Not everything always lines up. There's something, you know, the budget may go awry, the the set may be changing as you speak. I mean, it's just what filmmakers do. I'm kind of curious, with this particular film, was there a specific incident you can share that where things didn't go your way, but you knew how to kind of take a plan B into effect? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had only 18 days to shoot this film. And uh, Willie was, it was in the middle of South by Southwest and Willie Nelson has a big event at his ranch for three days. And that fell in the middle of our shooting. And they didn't want us to do anything before that event, the event people. Mm -hmm. So we rescheduled everything and then we were doing all of our outdoor scenes and it was torrential rain. So um, a lot of the time I would be shooting one person's dialogue and action and then it would be a number of days before I could film the other side because we have nothing behind them because nothing had been built. So it was incredibly um, – that, that that was sort of a big deal because, you know, you have to match that. And we weren't able to do that consecutively because of that situation so that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, and it's something you don't see in the movie. You know, you, you would never have guessed that while watching the actual film. Uh, another another element here is faith and spirituality. It, it's really important to the film, and I think capturing that on the screen is not easy. It could be heavy-handed. It could be, you know, it could not work. It could be maybe even divisive. I, I don't think those descriptions fall into your film. Talk about how you approach that part of the story because it, it isn't easy. Well, I, you know, as a filmmaker, I want to make films that have a spiritual message that connect to people and create different environments and draw big name actors towards them. Because Mm -hmm. I think the spirituality in this film is universal to everybody. And I think that these sorts of things that happen in the film happen to everybody And, you know, when you classify something strictly as a Christian film, you you really are not inviting other people towards it. And if you want ideas to flow through people, I think that often you have to sort of mix it up. And this is very much a faith film for me, um, but you have to sort of, um, you know, draw those those people who wouldn't necessarily watch a faith film Mm -hmm. towards your film because otherwise they just won't do it. And I don't think that's productive, you know? Yeah. And I think Willie Nelson, I I think we all have grown up with him. We know him in a way, I mean, as fans. And I think there's something about his spirit, which has always been kind of benevolent and, and welcoming. And I think he, you know, I, I think just having him in the film is, is, you know, captures that. Uh, You've directed him before in a more documentary setting. Now you're working with him as a as a as an actor. What is it about him? What is the essence of his creative soul? I mean, you see him in a way that fans don't see him. You're working on him one on one. You're talking with him. What what makes him so timeless and such an icon? You know, he's a really unique human being. You know, he, he's incredibly unique. He doesn't fit into 
a box at mm. all. I, you know, I, I, Bono said I, Bono was in the documentary that I did back then, and when I asked him to describe Willie Nelson, he said, you know, when we were children, we would play this game, Cowboys and Indians, and we'd always work out what is it that you want to be, which one. And he said, you know, Willie Nelson is both. <laughs> and that was a very good way to describe him because, you know, when I was making the documentary, I'm a woman filmmaker, and he he really let me do whatever mm. I wanted and trusted me. Um, he doesn't have an ego at all that tries to sort of step in and he's just he's just a completely unique person who has this beautiful connection to people. All of that ego driven stuff that comes from people with fame or, you know, he has none of that at all. He's the complete opposite. And that's just such a beautiful uh quality apart from all the other qualities he has as being a really good human being Mm -hmm. and being able to connect to people in a very deep way i mean willie will stay for hours after his concerts and sign autographs you know and he's just incredibly unique and i think that you know he also has a, a a face that conveys so much emotion by just standing still you know you know, I think that your co-star here, Sophie Lowe, probably fits that category. Her face is very evocative. It's exp- it's when she's doing nothing, you 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 get things from her. And to me, she may have the hardest role in the movie. Talk about like, working with her because she is the anchor here. I mean, obviously, she's the centerpiece. But I, I think another actress may stumble in this role. I, I think it's a really good performance in a way that is is kind of quietly effective. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I I, I really didn't want to um, cast a known actor. Sophie's done a lot of work, but she's not she's not known on a big scale. Mm-hmm. Um, I had seen her in a film with my friend Ben Mendelsohn uh, called Beautiful Kate many years ago, and she was just astonishing. And you know, I needed somebody that didn't have that worldly sort of face that hadn't. That, w- that had a face that was completely open and had a heart that was completely open. And mm-hmm. Sophie is very innocent and beautiful, and, and that comes across on screen. You know, I, th- there was no sense of judgment or cynicism or, you know, any sorts of those sorts of re- reactions from Sophie as an actor. And that was very beautiful, and that's very hard to do, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. To just- it, it, to not place something on what this person has said to you other than just complete openness, you know? Yeah. You, you talked a little bit about sort of the, Willie's lack of an ego. You've worked with so many, so many big names. And I'm kind of curious, when you're making a project and you'd like to have a, the cooperation of someone like Bono, who you, you have a connection with, you've worked with him, at the same time, I can't even imagine the demands on his time. Is it hard to kind of maneuver around their schedules? What What do you do as, as a as both a storyteller and a collaborator to kind of get Bono in, engaged in a project like this? Well, you know, way back when I think he was the first person I told that I wanted to write something for Willie. Uh-huh. And Bono's involvement in this was very limited. He didn't, you know, Bono helped me bring the financing to, towards the film and – He also co-wrote the end song and the orchestra, you know, the theme music in the film. But other than that, he was just a support as a friend, you Uh know, Um, because he is so busy. He has very, very important things every day that he has to do that are much more important than me making a film. So, you know, I, um, you know, but he was instrumental in helping me, you know, very Uh much. Well, I mean, what he contributed to your film is not not insignificant. I mean, that, I mean, just so many indie filmmakers are unable to make their movies because they don't have the cash and able to afford it. So, I mean, you know, g- good on him for helping you out. I I was kind of curious with all the people you've worked with over the years. I mean, these are giants in the industry. You know, Leonard Cohen and, and Bono, Willie Nelson, others. What do you think they have in common? Because I think on the surface they're all very different. And I think they all do different music. But I I suspect when you get to that level of artistry, there's something maybe that connects them. And I was kind of curious if if that's something you've kind of spotted or can talk about. Well, I think they're very – they're all very deep 
deeply uh, spiritual men. Mm-hmm. And I'm really drawn to people who are willing to take people on their journey with them. And that is something that's very special in this day and age, you know, that you have an artist that, um, you know, you can sort of follow. And I think that all of those people, those three people have that. And they, they were deeply spiritual people, all of them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm more drawn to work with people like that because it helps, it helps strengthen me. Uh, I learn so much from them. I think when you work so hard on films, if you're not spiritually gaining something and being able to sort of process and learn from these people as well, you know, it's just I I prefer to be in a realm with people who, you know, are connected in that way. Gotcha. Waiting for the miracle to come took a while to become a film and you've had the idea for a long time. Do you think in a way it was better that it came about now than maybe a decade or two ago? I mean, you know, you're a more established filmmaker. Your skill set, I'm sure, has grown over the years. Maybe this is sort of, was it all meant to be in a sense that it came about later than you probably originally anticipated? Well, I think that, you know, God has a plan, and I I think that, I think, think that that was right. You know, I think, it came, It was at the right time, particularly for casting for someone like Sophie, you know, mm-hmm. and Charlotte Rampling, who is such an esteemed actor. And, you know, so, so I think that through that, I think it was all, the timing was very right. You know, so I also, I always wanted to shoot it at Willie's Ranch, but, you know, the tax breaks for filmmakers not that great there. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure I would be able, but one of our investors was from Texas and he said, well, you know, if you can shoot the movie in Texas, then, you know, I'll come on board. And that worked out, you know, I was able to shoot it where I'd always dreamed to shoot it. You know, when I was doing the documentary, Willie has a place on the, um, his property that is called world headquarters. And that's where the casino is in the film. And I remember looking down the street when I was shooting an interview with Willie in that establishment, like in 19, I don't know what it was, but um, 95 or something. And I looked down the street and I saw the church and I just had this idea. The first thing was, you know, there's a church at one end of the street, there's a casino at the other. And that was my first um, sort of thought. So, Being there really sort of inspired that, you know? Gotcha. Before we let you go, Leanne, are you working on a new project you can kind of talk about? Is it too soon to say? What what can you tease us about the the future projects you're working on? It's a bit too soon to say. I have literally, I have a project I'm working on, but I had to sort of put it aside to get this one finished Mm -hmm. and bring it to the world, so to speak. So it takes a lot of work to do that. So, um, I put this other project aside, but I'm very much looking forward to getting back to it. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Leanne, for joining the HitCast. Leanne's new film, Waiting for the Miracle to Come, starring Willie Nelson and Charlotte Rampling, hits DVD April 29th. We're looking forward to more of your films, and uh, I love your approach to filmmaking. I think it's beautiful, and uh, we need more people like you uh, out there making great films. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out HollywoodandToto.com for both the show notes and, of course, the latest entertainment news. Please follow me at Twitter at HollywoodandToto. And we'd love it if you leave a podcast review over at iTunes. See you next week.